Hello. I was looking for that. Okay, hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to do is just run through some of my projects and try to give you a sense of what I've been up to for, I heard it back there, five decades. <laughs> so, but let's see, to start, um, let's see, start from the beginning. Okay, I live in Manhattan, we've lived in Manhattan, my wife Neela here is with me today, and we've lived in Manhattan since 1971. And I went to school at Pratt in Brooklyn, and I grew up in Kearney. I was born in Newark, New Jersey, and this is Kearney, which is right across the Passaic River, if you're familiar with that area. So that's me. Now, before I get into anything, I want to talk about some of the things that were very impressive to me when I was, especially when I was a kid. My grandfather was an engineer on the Lackawanna Railroad, and uh, he was really one of my favorite people growing up. He was in the Spanish-American War. Uh, after the war, he went out to um, New Mexico. He actually met the guy that shot Billy the Kid, Pat Garrett, and I got a lot of a lot of cowboy stories from him. So I didn't I didn't know what design was then. So I, I wanted to be a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> I was the kid in class that could draw. So uh, thank thank goodness. I studied at Pratt. I mentioned that and. Uh, my first job was at Delco uh, Products Division of General Motors. Actually, it was for General Motors, and I designed the um, the Delco symbol and all the packaging. So I got I had industrial design as my course training at Pratt. They didn't teach graphic design at that point. It was just coming to this country. I guess graphic design itself at that time in history came from Russia through the Bauhaus, through Switzerland to Chicago to New York and so forth. So I was at the point where it was just coming in to New York. Um, I met a student from Yale that studied with Paul, Paul Rand, and I just fell in love with wanting to do graphic design. So I had the combination here of being able to work dimensionally on packaging and the graphics with the symbol. After that um, program, I did my military training and I was in the advanced, um, well, fire direction center in the infantry. So I was actually the guy that worked on the maps. I had no idea that this was gonna be helpful in the rest of my life, but it was. I've done some maps. And then after that, I came back, and I didn't want to stay at General Motors. I wanted to be um, in a smaller office. It was a bit impersonal, and I had done such a lot of work there that I was going to have to wind up, I think, supervising the catalog for the packaging program. I didn't look forward to that. So I worked with a smaller office and got a, a job doing the graphics for the, uh, the American Pavilion at the World's Fair, uh, Trade Fair. World Trade Fair in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. Now this is in Zagreb. Uh, the theme of the show was for the Department of Commerce was constructive use of leisure time. I used an hourglass shape and a sun and moon for nighttime activities and suggested that we use it as the entrance and we did. So this is probably the biggest thing I've ever done and it was right in the very early part of my career. So I kind of got into uh, environmental graphics right away and vacuum formed the fence. And then I came back to New York and I worked for George Nelson. And George was uh, doing the Chrysler Pavilion. The office was doing the Chrysler Pavilion at the World's Fair in New York. Now the Chrysler Pavilion was, um, a it was designed for children by Chrysler, for Chrysler Corporation, and it had five islands. It wasn't just a pavilion, so all of a sudden I'm working on a pavilion that wasn't a pavilion, it was island. So it got into a wayfinding problem right away. And I developed a, a pointing hand as the, um, more or less the operating device for the whole fair. And uh, looked at doing signage that would work to get people to the different parts. And that was part of it. And as I mentioned, it was for children, so we did a little VIP button for the kids. And uh, I had done a lot of factory work in my early years, so I understood the factory. So I thought, well, why don't we do fact uh, safety posters so the kids know that what happens in factories. So this was at the, at the fair, and then the basic of this was a little character, and I just put him through different things that you had to be careful of at the fa in the factory. 
Some, some obvious. <laughs> and Howard Miller, which was one of George's clients, picked this up and made a product line out of it. And it wound up being in factories like DuPont. So uh, all of a sudden, everything's come around circle in, um, in that part of my life. Now this is my, uh, it's on my web, and this is a chronological spiral. So you can see the Delco rings are in the beginning of this, and then it goes around, you see the hand, and you get to the point where the Olympics start happening, uh, and that's in the 68. Now this was early in my career. I've done a lot of work since in those five decades. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about specifically the, the programs that are uh, icon-oriented, um, and I'll get into that in the specifics. But going back to Mexico, this is Neela and me, and Peter Murdoch, who I had met at the Royal College on a trip to London, and he came to New York on a scholarship, and we decided that we worked very well together, and uh, I left the Nelson office, and, and the process of being at the Nelson office, I met an architect who had worked on the, on the, on the Mexican pavilion, Eduardo Terrazas, and he had come and worked at the Nelson office after that, and I found out through him that they were having a competition to do the graphics for the Olympics, which had been given to Mexico City. So Neil and I had, we, we were married, we, well, let me backtrack a little bit. We made a deal to get on that list, and the way the competition was set up, he was going to have offices submit proposals, and then have individual designers come down to Mexico City for a two-week period and work on the project, and if nothing happened, he went home. Okay. This was our first day in Mexico City. We got on the list. Neil and I, in the meantime, got married in September. Uh, this is in uh, November. Uh, this is our first day in Mexico City. We had one-way tickets. We couldn't afford round-trip tickets, so we were taking a chance on all of this. <laughs> and um, there we are. That's Peter on the right, me on the left, and Neil in the center. Now. For the Olympics, we had to work with the five rings. We had to work with three languages. Uh, the languages were Spanish, French, and English. And the only thing that we got as a directive was don't make the program look like a guy with a sombrero leaning against the cactus with a bottle of tequila in his hand. So they, you know, they wanted to look more modern or get away from that uh, you know, idea of Mexico. So OK, we start with the rings. and. That is Eduardo, who I mentioned on the left. That's Ramitas Vasquez, Pedro Ramitas Vasquez in the center. That's uh, Matias Geritz in the back. Um, he's not, I'm not gonna talk about him very much, but he was very important for the whole Olympic program. He did the root of friendship with sculptors. That's Peter and me. And this was Christmas time in November. Uh, we didn't have a tree, but we had Christmas balls. That's our, our office. And of course, this is in 1966, so we had no computers then. So I, this, this is now, I still have all of my, my drawing instruments from that period. And this was done by one of those instruments. And this was the lucky part of the whole thing. It was, the two weeks were just about up. And um, we were beginning to worry because when we came in at the airport, Eduardo was saying goodbye to a, a, a Swiss designer. So w w Peter and I looked at each other like, ooh, this is serious. This guy's going back home after his two weeks. Luckily, I had the idea of combining the rings and the 68. And this is actually the first drawing of seeing if this really worked, the geometry of it. And of course, that is now the um, part of the, the logo that's kind of hung out for 50 years now and has done well in everyone's mind. Now from the uh, 68, I was able to develop the letters um, from the font and then put it together. And that's basically the way the, the logotype came into being. And uh, here you can see I developed the whole font after that and we use this throughout the program. And well, let me just mention um, New York, just had the MoMA show, Museum of Modern Art show of op art. So I was full of those kind of exciting ways of using flat images to, in, you know, create motion, to create vibration, to create uh, energy. All of those things that the Olympics is all about. So that was very helpful. And all I knew when we went down to Mexico, and I don't think Peter knew much more, maybe not even as much because he was from London, is that they had pinatas in Mexico. but. 
you know, it's, it's probably the, being naive is probably the best way to be because I, we spent about the first week over in the Museum of Anthropology and I never seen ancient work that I just love so much as some of those early cultures in Mexico from the Olmeca right up through the Aztecs and Mayans and there are a lot of cultures in Mexico that really in lump sum, uh, looking at them, they average out to be some of the best work in those early periods that I ever ran into. And this is just a very simple, um, I, it's probably a body stamp. Um, and you can see here the, the three-dimensional application does have a Mexican look. And that was the beauty of that Mexico 68. It looked Mexican. People started coming into our office. In fact, we didn't know whether we had won or not. This was the last day of the two weeks, and we were there for about four weeks, and I finally had to go into Ramitas Vasquez and say, you know, que pasa, the arquitecto, did we win? And he went, I guess so. So the whole thing was very Mexico, very Mexican. So that's the um, entrance to the stadium, the Olympic Stadium. This only, you could only get this shot on the first day. Even the Mexicans realized this was a little dangerous to have people up on the, the edge of the stadium sitting on the logo. And of course, letting, I mentioned uh, MoMA, letting the, the uh, radiation just occur and to keep coming out. Um, I, I made it one of the stamps, it was the poster actually the, of the games in Mexico. And also we developed, now this is where I'm going to kind of focus now, is on the icons. Now they had icons for the Olympics in, in Tokyo, but they were stick figures. Uh, what we developed here, and this idea really came from the students in Mexico, to make the icons be more uh, like glyph systems in Mexico. And um, I developed... Uh, from what they had started when Peter and I went, I got into this very, very heavily and developed this system and uh, this system. Now, this system is probably really the thing that sparked my real love for iconography and my real appreciation that it could um, really communicate not just to people that were illiterate easily, you know, easily, but to everybody. And it had worked very well for the cultural program where we had a very diverse series of things and identified them all to look like they were all part of one program using iconography. And I could tell you a lot about this, but let me show you other things that I learned from this part of the Olympics. First of all, the, um, the 68 uh, radiated outward to a point, and that was the background for the symbols. This was the, the Dove uh, for Peace. We had Peace as one of our programs. Uh, this 1968 was anything but peaceful. Uh, Dr. King was assassinated in that year, in 68, and the Mexican government asked me to develop or to design a stamp in m memory of him. They were the first country to design a stamp for Dr. Dr. King. And this was, unfortunately, the first time that I used the Dove on any application. Uh, the students were in revolution, like so many of the student groups around the world. And they had ideas about the Dove, too. Of course, the, gov the Dove kind of represented the Olympics, and it represented the Mexican government. So a lot of the things they did were kind of um, taking things that we had done on the Olympic program and transform them into being anti-government statements. There's a big exhibit of this now in Mexico City. I mean, the whole story is coming out little by little, and um, this is part of it. Um, Neil and I were in Mexico in different places, so to speak. She was at home and I was at the Olympic Committee. I didn't really, we didn't really know what was going on in the States that much. We had been there for two years at this point. Uh, I didn't know what was going on in the streets in Mexico. She did. She saw tanks. I come home, she said, I saw tanks today. You know, so little by little it started getting absorbed. They kept it very much from us at the Olympic Committee. Um, and I think everyone just wanted the Olympics to happen. It was a very, very, this was 10 days before the Olympics were opening. And they killed around 300, maybe more students in Tlatiloco when the whole clash finally came to a head. And um, Okay, that happened, and it was a very, very sad time in Mexico. The Olympics happened also, and uh, the Olympics was really uh, a kind of a magical event to be part of. I mean, I can, I'm speaking personally now. Um, this, this is where we were sitting, uh, and I, I took this photograph, and the games began. 
And then, of course, you had uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. We just came up from, um, from uh, Colorado Springs, where the, the 50th anniversary is this year for the Olympics in Mexico. And the team, the American team, had gotten together for 50th anniversary. So it was really, it was very uh, emotional to be back with all of these people again after 50 years. And these guys are, you, you can't meet two different personalities. I mean, Tommy Smith is um, kind of reserved, and John Carlos is anything but reserved. Now, I'm going to get back to them, to Tommy and, and, and John Carlos later, because I, I've, I've done some recent work that's related to that. But I want to talk about icons. And um, this is the early sketches I did for the Metro in Mexico City. Um, this was the program I did right after the Olympics. Um, and this is the M, the logo for the Metro, and the typography, and icons. Now. This was interesting because I, I, I knew that icons could be very helpful in a transportation system by identifying the different parts of it. And especially in a city, uh, you know, of the nature of Mexico, it's like Chicago or New York, a lot of people come and visit from other parts of the world. And uh, to give them, I mean, if you're from, from um, China and you're, you have a group that's going to meet in uh, Candelaria, you don't have to be able to say Candelaria, you don't have to be able to read it, you can tell your group to meet at the duck station. And you can do that in any language from wherever you come from. So, and now the duck station, the duck has a reason because they call that area where that metro stop is Candelaria de los Patos. And I said, what does that mean? You know, it's got, when, I, when we were doing the research, and they said, well, Mexico City used to be an island, and that station was on the waterfront, and that's where all the criminal elements hung out, and they called them ducks. So they call that area still Candelaria de los Patos, Candelaria of the Ducks. So, I mean, every one of these icons has either a story or an obvious relationship, and uh, it, it, it's worked now for... Um, for just about 50 years. And this is, of course, the signs. We call these lollipops because they, they light up at night and they were very effective. Now, these are the icons for line number one. And they were very helpful in the trays because we had the icons in the stations and you have the icons on, on the line map over the door. Uh, the typography is designed to be very architectural because that, that was the size of the band I had to work with. So I wanted to fill it up with typography. And you can't do with that with upper and lower case. Uh, so I kept everything in the same uh, format, more or less, as the logo itself. This is this year. So I mean, this has been going on now for 50 years. Nothing has changed in this, in this respect. This was the first three lines. Now they have 12 lines, and uh, the, the additional symbols have been designed by Mexican designers. And this is the, the map. Uh, we're working on this now. This isn't formulated completely yet. Uh, but the thing is, it's very easy to find your station on a map like this. It's much easier to find it than looking at a lot of text. And uh, of course it works, it does work for people that um, are illiterate in Mexico City, it works very well, but it also works for the guy that comes from China and wants to go to the Candelaria station. And the, the, the subway over the last 50 years has gotten a lot of very positive um, reactions. And the graphics have hung in there and they've done their job. And I feel very good about this. I mean, it's one of, one of my very favorite jobs that I've accomplished. Now, I came back, Neil and I had a daughter born during that period in, in Mexico City. And we came back to uh, New York in 1971. And one of the, I, I went into partnership with Bill Cannon, who I worked with at the Nelson office. And uh, we were Wyman and Cannon. And one of the first jobs we got was the Metro mapping. Now, Massimo Vignelli had done all the signs. And I guess he figured he was going to do the maps. But I think the strength of what went down in Mexico with the mapping especially, uh, I was able to um, get with Bill the, uh, this work. Now, we did the first map in, I think it was about 75, 1975. I mean, it went into operation. And in 2011, they came back to me and asked me if I could re redesign the map. And because they, have a, they had a, a line coming in from Dulles Airport. And the map itself, was, 
I made the lines very bold. I was hoping to put icons on the stations in Mexico, but uh, I mean in, in Washington, but wasn't able to do that. But what it did, it created a problem as far as adding a new line that had to run right through the center of the city. Um, the only thing I wanted to do was make the line, um, they, they call it the silver line. I said, well, silver is kind of gray, isn't it, when you print it without silver ink? Why don't we call it the uh, cherry blossom line? But that, didn't, that would have been nice to have some nice color in Washington. Anyway, here you can see it. Um, now, I show this because it's a, um, a public um, project. And here's where the symbols work very well here. They create a context on, on the Washington Mall, on the National Mall. And this was great. It, it made, actually made the front page of the, of the Washington Post. And they much, must have not had much news that Sunday, but it's just, <laughs> you can see it at the bottom. So that was good. And I, I'll just mention, uh, I really try hard to uh, explain what I do with this type of work. And I find that very helpful because I can talk to reporters, I can, I can be interviewed, and really have an understand, understanding of what I worked, and I can, ex I guess if you're a designer and you can explain to your mother what you do, you're, it's a good start. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm, I try to keep that tradition up. Now, these are different types of programs in different cities. This is in the city of Calgary, up in um, Alberta, Canada, and it's called the Plus 15. And that bridge is 15 feet above the, uh, the ground, and that's why it's called the Plus 15. It's a bridge system. It's a, at this point, it was over six miles of, of bridge, bridging that takes you across streets and through buildings. I mean, it's not such an uncommon thing in, in cold weather cities. Now, in starting that project, I, I realized in Mexico that going into the early cultures, a lot of these forms um, have a lot of strength and a, they can be very useful. This is the Blackfoot Indian people up in Alberta. And I was very impressed by the, when they have what they call a stampede. And every year you get the groups come together and, and have a big celebration. And the, the native groups up there are one of those groups. And the Blackfoot teepees all had these very strong uh, circles at the top. And I found out that they were star constellations. Now the plus 15 was a skywalk, it was a bridge system. So I took the name plus 15 and put it in, if you want, uh, Con I made a constellation out of it, as seen in the older cultures. And the other thing is they have a, a, a rodeo, and they're, they're, it's like going to Texas up there. I mean, it's, it's really a cow town. And this, the, the, this, actually, the, uh, the symbol of the city is a white Stetson. So I put a little guy walking uh, with a white Stetson. And the signs off the street just indicate that you can go into buildings and make it up to the plus 15. And the mapping is all of the routes are shown with the circles. And, and of course, a circle is a very easy form to route into both you know, tile or any kind of material, stone. And this helped people stay on the track because when you're in one of these systems, you're really cut off from the outside. Um, so you really need some kind of a wayfinding system to help you get through it. This is just north of Calgary. Uh, this is in Edmonton. And they have what they call a pedway system. Now, this is a little different because theirs is not just a bridge system. They have what they call a pedway that goes underground into a subway system, and they have the bridge system, and they have um, you know, different pedways that go through malls and so forth on the ground. So I indicated that with the signs. So if you were on the ground level, that's the sign entr entrance uh, sign. And if you're down underground with the subway, all the feet are on the lower level. And then the other thing here where I found icons very useful is on the map, and I did this in Calgary, to really indicate northeast, south, and west very clearly because you're inside and you don't have any visual uh, identity to see where your northeast, south, and west markers that you're familiar with are. So there's not much north, so I use a north star. They have the oil fields, they have the river, and they have the Rocky Mountains. And then you see how that's indicated on the map. And it gives you the first uh, 
where you're going. So, I mean, all of this is icons, yes, but it's a very, very integrated way of putting information together that help people find their way around. Now I'm going to go down to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, this is actually in Albuquerque, and these guys do have uh, dibs on the, uh, on the shape, both with uh, later cultures and with the very early, cult, uh, you know, the petroglyphic uh, remains of very early cultures. So we use this. Uh, this is a system. They had a grant from the uh, transportation department to do uh, signage from the highways to parking. And I, I remember being at a meeting and saying, well, this is great, but you have enough money here to do something that once you get to the parking, that tell people what's going on in the city. I said, you're not just a city of parking garages. And we used it that way. You know, and it was a very interesting overview. I mean, I, I, I was happy that I you know, had a good idea every once in a while I have those. And um, so what we did, now this is, um, an icon to indicate, you can see on the, on the old building, the railroad there, uh, the railroad station, that, that, uh, that tower. So what I, whoops, I just did something terrible. Wow. Oh, I see, let's okay. see. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to go back again. You see the uh, that that building? I use that as the icon for that uh, section of the town. And what we did was break up break up the city um, into six sections and identified each one of those sections as far as what went on, either historically or so forth. So you can see there's a kind of a theme that runs through all of this type of icon designing. Oh no. Why does it do that? Okay. I'll be more careful. Okay, so you can see how these are used on signs. And we kept that, uh, that kind of New Mexican jagged look that really does come out of the very early cultures. It seems like it might have been a pyramid shape or um, in, in the Cochina dolls, they, it's pretty typical also. But one thing, I'll say one thing about, now a lot of these types of systems are designed to uh, accomplish something. Albuquerque is kind of like where you go to get to Santa Fe. You know, you fly into Albuquerque, rent a car, and then go to Santa Fe. And they really wanted to be Albuquerque. They wanted to have, because a lot does go on in that city, both historically, and uh, it's interesting. So this was one, one way to help them, is to kind of, it's like excavating what's interesting in a city and making it available to people. The yellow uh, is the flag. I, I, I think that's the, the slide that I got mixed up on before. So the yellow background to all of the, uh, the signage and everything comes from this, the New Mexico flag. Now, after that, this was interesting because after that program, Santa Fe got interested. And like Santa Fe is very well known. Uh, and you know, it's a very popular place, but they had a problem. Uh, I'll just say that the, the, the approach here was very different. The uh, adobe, the color of the adobe, the turquoise, the black and white, I kept everything high contrast because of the sun. Uh, it's a very big part of Santa Fe. Now, here's where the problem is. You can see that yellow line. That's the old, that's the old Santa Fe Railroad uh, line that ran up to Santa Fe. And that's a corridor that's being really more and more developed. There's shopping malls and so forth. So at the end of that is the, uh, the old Zocalo or the city square. 
And that was starting to get run down a bit. I mean, the money was going down into the other parts of development. So what we suggested, I did this with Vaughn Wadeen. I worked very closely with any of you kn knew uh, Rick Vaughn. He's no, no longer alive, but I really loved working with him. And they're a, uh, they're a company, a design office in uh, Albuquerque. So Rick and I really put all of this together. Now, if you look at this, if you make the Zocalo or make the center of the city the center and then break it into four quadrants, the city can grow as much as it wants and still have identity um, in those quadrants. So we did that, and hopefully by doing that, we make the map look like the center is the center instead of you know going down to the Santa Fe area. So how do you do that? Well, the Zocalo is the Zocalo, and... Um, I use the Zocalo shape, and it's got, I think that's the oldest government building in the United States is on the uh, edge of the Zocalo. And the idea of uh, refurbishing a river that runs through that part of Santa Fe, uh, we thought was a good idea. I mean, they've done it in um, San Antonio, and it's a wonderful idea there. And there's no reason they can't, uh, little by little, get that working there. So that's the center, that's the Zocalo. Then you look up to the, um, up to the uh, northeast, and you've got the, the mountain range. You got where the wagon trains came in from the east, down in the, um, in the southeast. You have the old Santa Fe uh, Depot, the railroad itself down there. And then up in the, um, the northwest you have where typically all of the Indian pottery is made in this area. So that gives a, uh, a kind of a very quick map of the city, always keeping the center of the city in the center. So all, when, you, when you're driving in on, on the highway signs or the road signs, uh, it gives you where you are uh, and it gives you what you're going towards in the uh, direction. And then the downtown, the city, the center is always the one that's illuminated. And I don't have um, a lot of photos of this, uh, but the system is still working. And this was done, let's see, 2006, yeah. And again, uh, I had a, a, an interesting interview, and he really picked up on what we were trying to do. And I think that's so important. It's that, you know, that next step after you put a system in uh, is to make it understandable so people like it and want to work with it and keep it and so forth. Now, I mentioned before, you know, when I started doing the, um, the Metro in Mexico, they, you know, they, I was working with the highest echelon. Uh, Bernardo Quintana was in charge of the construction, and Angel Borja was in charge of the, and these were two very important. One was an engineer, and the other was an architect. They were really important architects and engineers there. And they said, no, 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 icons for the, you know, the, the, sta the stations of the Metro. You want us to look like a bunch of illiterates? And, you know, I I said, no, I said, and I, I, I really was able to explain that in the Olympic experience, icons really did their job. We didn't use any of the three languages. I could go through that program in, in minute detail, but on the tickets, we, all we used was graphics, and they worked. So, okay, we finally did it, and uh, today we don't question that anymore. We, you know, unfortunately, we navigate, well, maybe fortunately for us designers, we navigate our lives with uh, icons. Now, in looking at icon systems, uh, one of the things that I find is very helpful, uh, you have the Olympic sports at the top, you have the uh, Olympic, um, I guess you call them service symbols, then you have the cultural program, and then, now each one of these, if you notice, have a, has a different background shape. Now this is not something I invented. They've been doing this on highway signs for a long time, but you can do that on this type of uh, signage, and it's very helpful because it, it pulls things together as a system. And here you can see some of the different shapes I've used. The third one up from the bottom is Trenton, New Jersey, and they're on the, on the, on the river, so that's, I mean, each one of these, I try to have some kind of a purpose or uh, a reason for, for, for doing. Um, you have the Olympic on the top, you have um, the sports, you have the cultural, then you come down to the metro, and then you have the, um, we did the National Mall, Bill Cannon and I did that, and uh, actually Thomas Jefferson's rotunda um, is a, a pure circle. So I just took that and turned it over and used that as the banner shape for the mall. That's the Trenton I mentioned. And then uh, the Central Market in Mexico City. 
that's the entrance of the, of the Aztec market where they had those. And you have the A, it's called Central de Abasto. And you see the, uh, it's, it's also a distribution indicator. And, and then you get down to the very bottom and I showed you that. So you can see each one of these, um, it has a, a purpose and it has a reason for being. And I find I've been lucky that way because uh, I try to always do that with my conceptual approach to a project. And it, it just helps things stick a little bit better. Now, I'll just show you some recent work. That's John Carlos on the right and Tommy Smith. And um, I, I mentioned this I did for the Olympics. And uh, uh, Puma asked me to do something. They've, they've managed or they've uh, sponsored Tommy Smith since 1969. And in 1968, they introduced the Puma suede, which was their shoe. So what I, the attempt here was to integrate my dove and uh, the fist. And this program just happened because they had the, uh, I think it was the 19th or the 16th, the day 50 years ago that they raised their fist. And then I just came from um, Phoenix and uh, the, you know these types of programs that create awareness and the, and the I mean, I, I, I just really enjoy participating in them and making them visual because I think they're very important. I think somewhere along the line, we got to get over some of this stuff. That's John Carlos. <laughs> he, he's a real character, I love him. And now, I, I, I just want to mention, you know, it's a graphics program and it was done in 1968. And uh, the Washington Post asked me to do a cover. They were doing a special uh, edition on 1968. And we wound up using the typography from Mexico. I kind of worked on it to get it to be red, white, and blue, but it's still the same form, the same typography. So uh, I, I find it interesting. I mean, this is, in a way, I feel it's like bigger than I am. I mean, this thing has been out there and it's, been, it's had a life of its own. And uh, I feel very proud that I had the opportunity and I was able to design it, but uh, there it is. Now, I'm doing work in Mexico right now, and I had a, an exhibit at um, MWAC, which is the um, uh, new museum. It's a, it's a museum, and it's al also a, a gallery um, that has changing shows. And I had a show on my graphic design. Um, this is where the, the idea of my urban icons comes from. And uh, this was magic because it got me in touch with people I worked with 50 years ago. And it also um, put a lot of programs together in, into one area where you could go in and kind of get a sense of, you know, how these things work. And a lot of it went, is, went into quite a bit of detail. And out of that, um, I designed the Memorial 68. And this is uh, the memorial that houses all of the, um, the work that um, came out of the students. Now, I, I don't think I mentioned, I, I gave a talk at the um, architectural, I think it was the architectural and design school in um, the University of Mexico. And I showed, um, you know, the Olympics in, in a lot of depth. And at the end of the, um, the talk, the rector of the school came up to me and said, uh, you know, I, 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 he, he says, you know, he's talking to me like he's up here now with me. He said, I apologize that we couldn't do this. And he gave me a book. He, I, we couldn't do this earlier. But, um, you know, I want to thank you personally for making a graphic system that I could use. He was one of the students out in the street making these posters. And it was a book of all the posters that the students had done to be anti-government. And I broke down. I, I mean, I, it just was one of those things. I always felt, I felt a little dirty. You know, I, was, I was like 29 years old. I'm working for the Mexican government. They were killing kids that I wasn't even aware of. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was really, a weird experience because I didn't want the Olympics to be stopped, but I always felt like I maybe could have or should have done something after that. And when he gave me that book, it was like lifting something off my back. It was really a kind of a liberating experience. And you can't make that stuff up. I mean, it just was, it happened, you know. And this is the memorial. This is where all of this information is housed now. And instead of the rings, I used the dove coming out like a phoenix. 
Now this is the, the last thing I want to show you. And this is current work. And uh, this is for the metro bus, bus system that runs right down the center of Mexico City. And you can see the three lines of the typography. Um, I use that as creating a structural element. And this is the, uh, the bus stations as we design them. And here you can see we're getting into uh, computer renderings and actual models. And this is uh, the, the, the way that structure is made. It's an it's a aluminum extrusion. And here you can see it now being installed in Mexico City. And this is working out quite, uh, quite nicely. It, it's, it's kind of pulled in the system from the metro and it's done it. And I worked with uh, I worked with a company called J.C. Deco, and you, any of you that are involved with advertising in the street or airports. Now, what they do, they they keep everything maintained, so they make their money on the advertising below, but they keep everything. The maintenance is what they really give the city, and. Anyone that does signage for a city, you know it looks great, and then uh, a week later it starts getting graffiti or whatever, and then 10 years later, if you're, l you're lucky if it's still there. So this is uh, something that I'm really, really happy about, that this is going to be around. And we did the maps, and you can see a lot of this comes in from uh, the metro itself. Developed an MX. Um, Pavers, oops, wall. I'm not going to try and go back. Yeah, I can go back. <laughs> and this was a, an idea for a sculpture. This hasn't been made. Now, this is this is a very recent project, and I really love this one. This is they have, uh, you know, this, the metro is a subway. It's underground, and wild dog. Well, I don't know how wild they are, but they live in the metro. So they, uh, the, the the metro itself started a program where they go in and they rehabilitate these dogs and get them back into being friendly dogs again, healthy, friendly dogs, and uh, put them up for adoption. So they asked me if I could do a symbol for them. So I took their, uh, their original Metro symbol and transformed it into uh, an adoption symbol for the dogs. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> He's the mayor. <laughs> And that's one of the signs, and I'm still doing it, so thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All yeah. Right. Yeah, let's have some. Oh, thanks for sharing all of that. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm going lim to limit myself to one so we can open it up to the audience to ask a few as well. Um, I was really inspired by your work in the 68 Olympics and how it sought to bridge boundaries between languages. I think that's very important, aside from just from a wayfinding perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, how do you believe, or do you believe, I guess, that design could connect us or support universal understanding in this very divisive time that we're living in? Yeah, I, I, I do believe it can, and I think uh, it has to, I mean, I see the profession itself spreading out into other areas of design, but I think what we have to do is get into other areas of communication that aren't just uh, designers talking to designers, because I think it can be a very unifying uh, part of any culture, really. I mean, it has been in different ways, but I think now, um, especially the way uh, things are set up with our technology and our ability to communicate so quickly and so forth. Um, I don't know, sometimes that's not so helpful. And I think graphics has been helpful as far as uh, making it understandable how to communicate. And I think the nature of that is, uh, you know, I, I, I find that, um, like I, I showed you the Metro dog. I mean, that's, it's a very likable type of thing. and. and you know, you, you can put those images out in the city and they don't get banged up, you know? Yeah. So I think uh, designers have to get more involved in the community itself and get a sense of what's, what's necessary and then we can be much more effective. Great, thank you. Zoe, do you want to take some questions from the audience? Yes, sounds great. 
So it's time for the Q&A with the audience. We have about time for two or three questions. We will be circulating these two mics, so please raise your hand. And when we hand it to you, please stand with it. Question over here. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. But this picture up here is very provocative. Did you do anything for Apple? Uh, I love showing, uh, no I didn't, but I love showing that slide of the iPhone and the, <laughs> when, when they're part of the, you know, the speakers. And then go out and have a beer with them and get on them more. <laughs> we have a question over here. Hi, thanks very much. It was really uh, inspiring. But are there any designs that you wish you had designed? Mm. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I like the apple. Getting back to the apple. <laughs> I, don't, I really haven't thought about that too much. No, I've been pretty satisfied with you know, what I've done. Um, I mean, there are a lot of designs I like very much out there, but uh, you know, I don't want to be hogging everything. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, not really. I haven't thought about that. I think it would, you know, intelligent answer. <laughs> Wondering if you'd given any thought to the idea that um, nowadays many people don't navigate by themselves but have their phone do their navigating and they're seeing for them. And so publicly visible icons are less as important than the thing you're looking at six inches in front of your nose, which is doing all the looking and all the thinking and all the navigating for you, which migrates the navigational challenge to you versus your screen as opposed to you versus the world. Have you ever given any thought to how you think if you were ever given the challenge to go back to some of these wayfinding systems and do them again in the age of navigating smartphones, you might do it a little differently? No, I, I think what I've done and what I'm doing can be integrated with the technology of the smartphone, the iPhone, the, you know, uh, because what, what I've been doing is really part of the environment that the iPhone is getting you around through. Now, when you lose your iPhone or your battery's dead, you're screwed, you know? And if, if this stuff is out there, I mean, I wouldn't rely, t let me put it this way, I wouldn't rely too much on, on that. I mean, I've been in enough um, experiences where uh, you have an Uber and his, his uh, you know, you're completely lost. I mean, we just had an experience like that. You get in an Uber, his uh, navigation system goes down, and you say, well, let me get out and I'll go up here, and, or can I just pay you money? I mean, you're really, it's like a complicated situation that's created by uh, this thing that makes everything so easy. So making everything so easy uh, is great, uh, but the language is the same that's being, being used. Um, so I don't see a big difference there, to tell you the truth. I don't think you need certain types of uh, um, saturation of information out in the environment, but uh, that's the good thing about it. You can get more um, pristine with your application of the um, environmental stuff, I mean the physical stuff, but I wouldn't rely too much on your iPhone or your, you know, have you ever lost your iPhone? <laughs> 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 I'm using my iPhone to find my lost iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we do have time for a few more questions, so feel free. Oh, sorry. Hi, thanks so much. Your work's really inspiring. Um, have you um, had the opportunity to, on your own or with others, design wayfinding for people who are visually impaired? I've done that by, you know, you're kind of mandated to do that um, when you're doing signage systems for buildings or environments where there's laws that uh, have you do that. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've done that, uh, but not specifically only for that, uh, only, always as part of a, uh, a program. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you were trained as a designer, uh, industrial designer. I wonder if you uh, think that you would have been, um, that you would have found design anyway if it hadn't been that first project that, that shook you this way. And then also, um, how did that training influence the design that, um, that your career? Well, I, 
like I said earlier, they didn't teach graphic design, so I didn't have the option. I wasn't interested in advertising. I wasn't interested in illustration. I wasn't interested in fine art. I made models when I was a kid, model airplanes and so forth. So when I saw the school and I saw what they did in the school, industrial design seemed like a good idea for me. Uh, but when I discovered graphic design uh, and I got involved doing graphic design, I realized that my understanding of space, how to work with space, how to work with systems, how to work with some of the things that um, I learned as an industrial design student really gave me a leg up as far as uh, you know, putting it all together. I mean, we live in a three-dimensional world and graphic design has been pretty flat for most of its history. And now it's just starting to really come into the world, um, you know, more so. We have a question over here. So a lot of what you have designed has related uniquely to the place where you were designing it. I'm interested in your thoughts about universal icons um, yeah. that can either be incorporated in what you do or that are simply on their own. Uh, that's a good question, and I, I think one of the things that I did very early on was identify these two areas. Now, in the Olympics, you have the service symbols. You have them in airports. I mean, that's by, by their nature, it would be a good idea to have everyone from every place can understand them. Uh, okay, having said that, uh, a sense of place is not a bad idea, so how do you do that? Well, you can do it with the same understanding. I mean, a duck is a duck is a duck, right? I mean, um, but it also has meaning and significance for a very specific, you know, idea or place or job that it does. So I think in, in what I've tried to do, I try to cover both of those bases. I mean, I've done, I, two of the systems that we did in Mexico were used as um, examples when the, when the um, AIGA did the um, symbols for airports with the Department of uh, Transportation, both the Metro and the, um, I use silhouettes in, in the Metro and I use developing icons. And I had done that probably more so in where necessity, you know, uh, demanded, and that was airports and transportation systems. And they did it in the Olympics because we had an international audience. So the Olympics was a boiling pot for really experimenting in both of those areas. So uh, I hope that answers your question, because it's a good one, and it's, it's a very real. And they, they, they run into each other quite a bit, you know? And I mean, if you even look now at service symbols, uh, I, I think people have a, a need to not make everything the same. It must get boring or something. And they try to make little changes. And it, I mean, as a designer, you don't like to see that, because you see your work get kind of transformed into something else. But uh, that's the reality of it all, and uh, that, that's a good question to be answered as things go on, whether that remains, you know, whether those uh, international symbols, and believe me, if you want to get into that, uh, one of my former students did a book on that, and it's a big, big book, and there's a lot of ways of making an international symbol uh, from all different countries the same symbol, but, uh, you know, so it's tricky. Yes. Do you, have, do you have any thoughts about why institutions seem to resist wayfinding information? I personally find myself about once a week in a situation where the signage is either absent or so misleading. <laughs> and it seems like institutions like large hospital complexes, universities, they resist an investment in that kind of improvement in navigating. Yeah. What, what do you base that on? Because I, I, I have, you know, I'm not personally involved, but I know a lot of people that do very in, intense systems for hospitals and universities and so forth. I don't want to name any names, but. <laughs> <laughs> Northwestern? <laughs> Northwestern. <laughs> Northwestern. Yeah. No, that can be a problem. I, I mean, you know, it sounds like more of a, one that you're familiar with. But um, yeah, I mean, you can really screw up if you put a bad system in because. Uh, It'll put people off wanting to do that type of system. And that, I guess that's the same with anything. Even the doctors have that problem, you know. You know, I mean, if you mess up, you're not going to be 
wanted to be seen around. I think I might so. jump in with one last question here, yeah. if that's okay. So um, I interviewed you 10 years ago, one of the five decades that we were talking about. And I asked you, how do you face designer's block? And you gave me a great answer. I experience designer's block when fear enters into the mix. When a good concept is elusive, I experiment with different approaches rather than worrying about it. Design is a process, and when I can treat fear as a stimulus rather than a block, it actually helps. So I'm curious, do you still feel fear when you design? And also, does fear motivate you in other parts of your life? Yeah, that's absolutely accurate for now, too. Yeah, I mean, that's, I said that. That's, that's really <laughs> <laughs> You're a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, wow, that, that, I would say the same thing right now, yeah. No, I think fear is a great motivator. You know, I mean, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of gets you working at your uh, your highest degree, whatever you're doing, in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I think in order to have fear, you have to have some idea of what you're shooting at. You know. Yeah. I mean, if you satisfy yourself very easily, uh, it probably doesn't enter into it. So I mean, if you're really looking to be the best at something or trying to get a really good idea for something, and you know, it's not coming. And I'll, I'll give you a good example of that. Um, when I came back from Mexico in 1972, the Olympics were held in Munich and Sapporo. And I got a call from the postal service here and they said, you're our stamp guy. You know, I did a lot of stamps in Mexico. And they said, we want you to do two stamps for Sapporo and two stamps for Munich. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's more Olympics. Like, how, can I, how am I gonna do better? I mean, I, 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 would, I could feel the fear right away. Like, oh my God, I have to do something uh, again for the Olympics. And uh, I really let that, I mean, that really inhibited me right up until the very end. And I realized that um, both countries use stick figures for their sporting events. So I, I just put their stick figures on in motion on the stamps and got past it. But, you know, I mean, I, yeah, it, it's real. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm serious this time. A very loud round of applause for Lance. <laughs> Thank you.